Hi, everybody. I'm Maida Dabare, and I'm going to be talking today about the Guardian Data Ecosystem, one of the flagship products of the Big Data Platform. Um, so to start with, I'm going to couch this in terms that I think we've all probably grappled with. Um, we, we find ourselves often asking questions such as those that I'm going to put up here. Uh, where can I find data on nutritional status of rural households? Um, what is the profitability of fertilizer use in sub-Saharan Africa? Where should I be investing? Where does it make sense to, to, to do this? I've been told that I need to make my data fair, but I have no idea how to do this. Um, can you help me? And I want to, to be able to collect my data, uh, my agronomic data, that's already standards compliant. Are there any tools to help me do this? So these are the kinds of questions that, that many of you might have asked yourself. And what I'm going to present uh, is, is a sort of a, a quick overview of the tools and services that will hopefully make you see that it is possible to answer these questions and to, and to use these tools and services uh, meaningfully to do that. So this is a schematic of the Guardian data ecosystem. Uh, I know it's a lot, but I'm going to boil it down uh, for you. So let's start with the heart of the ecosystem, which is guard the Guardian data discovery portal. Um, this only allows the discovery of, of data. It doesn't actually hold the data assets uh, on, on, by themselves. So the data assets, whether they be publication or, or data set, are sitting in the, the, the institutional repository where they were actually generated uh, or where they were uploaded to begin with. So here on the, on the left-hand side, you see these boxes. Um, so we have data right now uh, that, that's discoverable coming from the 30-odd uh, CGIR repositories. Uh, USAID's uh, Development Data Library, the, the UK's Foreign Commonwealth Development Office, uh, the World Bank's uh, LSMS data is there, and there's going to be more uh, coming, the LSMS data meaning the survey, uh, Living Standards Measurement Survey data. Um, there's, there's the USDA's uh, Ag Data Commons that we're harvesting, um, the Government of India's Open Data Portal, and there are a few more that will soon be available by the end of this year, certainly. Now, all of these data are available sort of as a one-stop shop uh, so that you can do a keyword search and retrieve data from all across these different providers. But that data is also able to be then discovered by search engines um, and used by external apps. Um, and there we're, we're uh, bringing in, uh, you know, going much beyond the, the researchers, hopefully, to make data available to a larger uh, variety of stakeholders. But to, to get to this point, you need data that's well described, that's richly described, consistently described, uh, ideally using standards. So, and, and these standards were, 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 we call common semantics, essentially. So the, the bottom cog of these, this two cog system um, represents the workflows that help you comply with standards, that help you annotate your data in ways that make sense, both in terms of a consistent metadata schema, um, as well as ontology terms to make the data variables uh, more consistently described across your own project, uh, different trials in your own project, but also across experiments, uh, you know, in the, in the agricultural space in general. Um, there are also tools to actually um, allow the collection of semantically enabled data, so already standardized data uh, at the collection point. And I'll talk a little bit about, about these. You're welcome to dig in further and, and um, look at these tools because they're, all, they're available, all of them, uh, for everybody to use, they're open. Lastly, the question is, okay, so, so what can I do with all of this nice stuff that you've enabled, all of these, these data sets that are available now? And so we're in the process of developing pipelines um, and analytical tools uh, for, 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 for researchers and others to be able to derive insight from, from the data sets that they find through the Guardian uh, data ecosystem. And they can uh, you know, so, so we have analytic pipelines that we're developing. I'll speak a little bit about that, but also uh, data visualization, increasing numbers of data visualization um, uh, possibilities as well. So that's the, the Guardian data ecosystem, and I'm going to start diving into pieces of this now. We'll start with the heart of it, which is the data discovery portal. And so what does that look like? Here's the homepage of, of Guardian. Um, and the, the very 
first, um, ho the homepage, the, the, at the top of the homepage, you'll see that we make available, um, we're providing access to about 170,000 publications and almost 28,000 data sets. There's also a data management toolkit icon that you see there. And by clicking on that, you will see all of the, the numerous um, tools and services, some of which I just spoke about, uh, and we'll be speaking about a little bit more, uh, that are available to you. So feel free to check that out, try it out. Um, here's the, the URL for that. Um, and we'd love to hear from you if you have feedback on it. So just diving a little bit deeper from that initial landing spot, um, here's how we've organized it. it you, you, can, you can explore our publications and data sets or other um, types of resources. You can collaborate with your team on a data science project. That's the analytical environment we've developed. I'll talk a little bit about that as well. Um, and you can get help with a specific issue that you're having, for instance, with your metadata or with your personally identifiable information. How do you hide that? Um, or how, how, do I, how do you make your data fair? All of that um, is, is here, it's clickable, it'll take you directly to the resource. Um, as you go further down, whoops, as you go further down, um, you will see um, the, the publications and data sets organized uh, by geography, essentially. So here, these, these kind of ochre um, uh, bubbles that I hope you can see uh, pretty well are showing you the publications by, by continent, essentially. But if you click on any one of those bubbles, you'll be able to see publications by country. So, so you can dive in to specific geographies if you, if you wish. And, and the same thing is true uh, for the data sets, which is this blue icon here on the right. Um, so when you click on that, you'll see these bubbles turning blue and you'll see the same sort of thing and you'll be able to dive in the way you want. If you go further down, um, you can browse our resources uh, by, by the kind of resource that you're looking for. So here, um, you see in the first sort of uh, uh, tool is, is the first set of tools is data gathering kinds of um, issues that, that you might face and how you get over, over them. What I'm showing you in the middle here is the data curation resources that we have at hand. And by clicking on any one of these, uh, you can get to the resource. But what, do we, what we've tried to present here in this sort of panel view is, is, a, is a way for you to, to look at what the resource is about um, and see a brief description on, on what this is. Um, there are also resources, services, and tools for, uh, for data an analysis and management. So you can click on that um, button there that I've outlined um, and have a look at those resources. So I'll be covering many of these in this talk, but not in any great detail. So it's up to you to go in and sort of check it out a little bit more. Let's dive back to what a search actually um, returns for you. So here's a question that we started out with. Where can I find data on nutritional status in rural households? When I do a search in Guardian, in the, in the um, search box on the Guardian homepage for nutrition in households, I can add to other terms like gender or female or, or whatever it is you're looking for. Um, what I see for this particular search is I get about 1,200 publications and just under 500 data sets. Now, when I look further at, at where those data sets are coming from, this is just one of the pages from that search. Um, I see that uh, ab about three CGIR centers here, IFPRI, ILRI, and SIAT, but I'm also seeing data from USAID and the World Bank. If I dug deeper into, this, into, into these 483 data sets, I would find resources from USDA's Open Data, um, Ag Data Commons, I would find uh, perhaps data sets from the Indian government's um, open uh, data portal, the agricultural data sets there, um, and a number of other resources that might be valuable, like, like the UK's uh, FCDO uh, uh, repository as well. So check it out and, and see what you, what you can find for what you're looking for. Um, I also want to mention that at the top, the top bar here, you can filter in a variety of different ways, by year or by provider, or again, by geography. And on the left-hand side, you see a, a set of boxes there, um, themes, top years, et cetera. Those are facets that you can use to narrow further on, on the searches you, you do. So this is, this is um, a useful resource, and I encourage you to try it. Um, let us know what you think. But when you find a data set, and when you actually dive in to, you, you click on a data set that you find, here's what the, the view looks like. So in the center here, you see the, you know, the title of the data set, 
the provider where it's available from, the authors, uh, a bit of an abstract or a summary of the data. But on the left-hand side, you'll see machine-readable licenses uh, to the extent possible. You'll see a link to the data. So as I said, the, we don't hold the data set in Guardian. Um, we're pointing to it. We're making it discoverable. So this is a link, uh, in this case, the digital object identifier that'll take you to the data set. You might see a handle there as well, a handle link. Now below that, um, you see a little bit uh, mapped out for you, uh, uh, the geography that, that, is th that, that, that pertains uh, to this data set. So that's kind of nice to look at as well in a, in a visual way. If you keep going further down, you scroll further down in this data set, what you see is, is, a, is a keyword cloud. And that keyword cloud consists of um, terms typically from uh, Agrobok, the controlled vocabulary, the, the agricultural controlled vocabulary maintained by um, the FAO. Um, and this is, these are terms that are in general input by the data managers and the information specialists. Uh, particularly at CGIR centers. But uh, Guardian also uh, does some metadata enrichment, quite a bit of metada metadata enrichment. And so you'll see here um, some ontology terms perhaps and some more Agrivoc terms uh, coming in as well through text mining approaches. Um, you see in this case, you also see data set files in fact, because uh, for the less restrictive CC0 or CC BY data sets, you'll be able to do a direct download from here, but for the more restrictive data sets, you'll have to use the DOI or handle link that I pointed out earlier. Um, at the very bottom of the page, uh, you see relevant publications, and that is an attempt to tie um, publications that might help you put this data set in context. So that's, that's coming from Guardian. Our algorithms are trying to give you uh, some, some useful information. Uh, when you're looking at a data set, it'll provide you relevant publications. When you're looking at publications, you'll see relevant data sets. Um, the, 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 the other interesting thing here to note is uh, the, the FAIR metrics that you're seeing in this little panel that I just pointed to. Um, that's just a way to help people make their data even, or a data asset really, even more fair, whether it's a publication or data set. Um, so it gives you, uh, Guardian is, is scoring uh, these resources, each of these resources for how, how findable it is, how accessible it is, how interoperable it is, and how reusable it is. We don't pretend that the, this is any perfect method of scoring, but the point is that it's the same metric that's applied to all of the resources. Um, and while we're trying to improve the metrics, um, right now they're uniformly applied across, across all of the resources. So it's kind of a helpful way of, of looking and seeing how you can make your data asset um, fairer. Right, so let's switch gears a little bit and, and start um, looking at the other part of the, of the Guardian data ecosystem that I, that I showed you. This um, is, is about the workflows to comply with standards. And I just have one quick slide here to show you this um, in relation to the question that we asked earlier. I've been told I need to make my data fair, but I have no idea how to do this. Um, so we have developed the FAIR workflows to enable you to, to upload your data to an institutional repository of your, of your choice, or if you don't have one, um, to upload it to a Guardian um, repository that, that will make your data visible in the, in the, in the, along with all of the other data assets that I just showed you. So, so this is based on the Collaborative Open Plant Omics, or COPO2, uh, developed uh, in the UK at Norwich uh, University. And what, what you see here, uh, you, well, you won't see it here, but what you'll see if you, if you try out our workflow is a step through um, set of, um, well, steps, I guess, um, that, that the first of which is, it will, will help you identify if there's any personally identifiable information in your data set, for instance. So you'll be alerted to that um, and you'll have to decide what to do with it in, 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 and given some guidance in terms of, uh, being, you know, having to mask um, or remove uh, names, for instance, of farmers. Um, it's, it's, it's a way to minimize your risk uh, of, of, of exposure, really. The next step is to uh, a, a simple step through schema, essentially, to, to uh, annotate your data set with uh, repository level metadata. So it's a, using a, a, a metadata schema that conforms with the Dublin Core metadata schema. 
Um, and the last step in this workflow, uh, and along the way there, you'll also have uh, a the, the ability to choose an appropriate license. And we, we try to make it easier with a sort of a guide, a quick guide um, to help you choose a license, the appropriate license. Um, the last step in this is if, you're, if, you, if you have a data set, you can annotate the data variables in your data set using ontology terms. So here, we're, as, I, as I stress, we're, we're trying to make um, data fair. We're trying to help you uh, with this easy workflow to verify your data. I encourage you to try it. Um, I don't have a link for you yet, but it will be available um, through the, the Guardian um, page, as I showed you, so try it out. The next step is to actually collect data that's already standardized. And in fact, this is the better way to do it. So, so what we've tried to do is um, to answer this kind of question. Are there tools to help me collect standards compliant agronomic data? Um, so this is, a, this is a tool called the Agronomy Field Information Management System or AgroFIMS. And what it does is that it helps you collect data digitally uh, by via standardized field books that you generate. So you, you go to the website, the AgroFIMS website, um, and you generate your field book based on your experiment and your experimental design, your statistical design, um, uh, very user friendly, and you uh, set up your field book, you go out, you collect your data uh, using the digital data collection tool, um, and then you can do a variety of things. You can upload the data to your institutional repository, but you can also uh, bring it back to AgroFins and do some quick statistical checks um, and generate a report that's very nice looking and very useful um, for publications and, and so on. So there's some value add to that as well. Um, the, the, the data that you collect, the, the metadata associated with the data that you collect, aligns with the, with the CGIR, CG Core metadata schema. So that's, that's nice. It conforms with the Dublin Core. Uh, schema, essentially. So there's a lot of um, nice things about this uh, tool. And again, you can try it. Uh, there's the URL, agrofims.org, easy to remember. Um, go ahead and, and try it and get back to us if you have questions or concerns. So I talked a little bit about uh, what you can do with well-described data. And I want to show you, uh, as, as the last part of my talk, a little bit on the, on the analytical uh, environment and, and the visualization capabilities. So this is an effort to answer the question of, I want to work with a team. I, I want to set up my lab team or my project team or my uh, country team, whatever it might be. And I want to work with them, with, with the team members, to be able to find data, to be able to save it and look at the same sort of data sets, to be able to securely share data among team members, and to be able to analyze that data. So this, uh, what we've developed here is, is called CG Labs or Collaborative Guardian Labs. Um, and it is uh, a, an R and Python based environment to enable you to do this. Um, the idea here is that you set up your team, you, you add members very easily, um, and you're, you're then searching, you're, you're searching essentially Guardian for, for data and being able to save it um, in your workspace here. Uh, but you can also upload data from elsewhere. So it's, it's quite flexible. Um, you can you can install it in your in your space, whatever that space is. Uh, it could be your laptop or it could be some server, um, and you could use any compute environment essentially that you that you want for your high compute types of jobs. Um, so it's it's really quite flexible, um, and and we built it specifically with that in mind. And it's it's a good collaboration tool because it combines the functionalities of Slack, um, uh, FTP, Mail, Dropbox, etc. So you don't need to use these separate tools uh, to uh, to communicate and and share data, for instance. Um, it's based on Globus, the Globus software, uh, which is what allows us to enable this very secure um, uh, data transfer and exchange. And so users must have a Globus account to start. Um, and you can do that quite easily via your institution. If your institution has an account, it's a very easy search um, to, to be able to tell whether your institution has an account or via Gmail. Quite easy to use. And we have quite a bit of um, help there on the CG Labs pages as well. So um, what happens if you want to visualize data, if you want to explore and download spatial data in this case? Um, so here you would go into CG Labs um, uh, geospatial exploration module. Um, and in this case, when, when I've opened it, what you see is uh, the, the four little icons on the left there. The, the, the second one of that is the thing that looks like a little stylized plant. Um, what I've chosen there is the CMIP6 
uh, climate data set, which is which is the last one down. You see it being, you know, it, it's highlighted orange. Um, and I can do this this downloading of, of data uh, once I know what I want um, in very few steps, very few clicks, essentially. So what I've done here is I've gone in, I've chosen uh, uh, my, my CMIP6 model. In this case, it's a CNRM CM6-1 uh, model. Uh, I'm looking at the parameter that I want to choose, which in this case is maximum temperature. I've clicked on that box um, and I've pinned the region of interest, in this case, India, uh, by going over now to the right-hand side panel and choosing the third icon down, which looks like a little uh, pin. And I drop it on India, but then I can choose the admin level. So if you look at the last uh, uh, icon down there on the, on the right, you see admin level two. That's because I've slid the my my I've, ch I've chosen the slider uh, there to say admin level two, and I've I've essentially been able to dive down to that particular um, uh, uh, sub region essentially, and now I can download the the raw data from that. So I'm I'm taking a slice of that very large seven or eight terabyte data set, the slice the particular slice or slices that I want, and I can download them as GeoJSON or CSV. So it's really nice for people who who want to do some quick visualization and, and kind of um, download a particular data that, they, that they're interested in. So this, this brings me to the end of my talk, but I, but I want to end with the question that you're probably asking, some of you at least skeptics are asking yourself, which is, so what? Um, I don't get it. Uh, what can I still, you know, what, what is the value of this? Um, and for that, I encourage you to, to, to come to our Guardian in Use session that's just following this one. And we'll have um, three very good speakers talking about particular use cases, one associated with um, Guardian itself and a very nifty analysis that, that they did, the, the profitability of fertilizer use case. Um, uh, the second speaker will talk specifically about their use of CG Labs and how uh, they were able to use it and how it's helped them. And the third speaker will talk more about the analytical pipeline, particularly with reference to simulation, crop simulation models. So please join us. Um, and I thank you for visiting uh, this, this presentation. Thank you. A little bit and what you'll hear about now is is um, uh, talks from three speakers who have actually used the guardian data ecosystem or plan to use it in different ways and you'll hear a little bit more about guardian in use uh, the first speaker is robert Haymans from the university of california davis uh, the second speaker is anira Tagosh from uh, siat and the last speaker will be Cheryl Porter from the University of Florida, who is also very active um, uh, and, and leading part of the AgMIP uh, project uh, focused on, on modeling. So over to you, Robert. Hello, everybody. I'm sharing my screen right now to show you that I will speak about the profitability of fertilizer use in Africa, new research to old data. Uh, and I will focus more on the on the data aspect because that's what this session is about. But this is um, I will I will give you a little preview of um, a larger research uh, endeavor led by Camila Bonilla, who is at SIAT, uh, who has worked with um, Jordan Chamberlain at CIMIT and with with myself. Okay, now I did need to figure out, of course. Sorry about that. There we go. So the first thing is the promise. And Meta has talked about this open data. This is what I put together about a year ago. Uh, yeah, how many open data sets are there and who provides them? And so this is rapidly growing. So there will be many more today. Um, but the other thing that's important to point out is that the CJR, who's organizing uh, this conference, has really been in the forefront of making open data, open research data available. There's others who do the same thing, particularly in France and some Peter Future project in the US in the United States, but but really CGR has has uh, been a trailblazer here. So this is fantastic. So there's a lot of data sets that we can now look at, whereas in the past we wouldn't have access to. And the question is, well, what can we do with it? Well, um, we were interested in some questions around soil fertility and fertilizer use and, and crop responses in Africa. So 
Uh, Camilla did these searches around maize and fertilizer, uh, maybe spelled a little bit differently in Guardian. Uh, and in the end, selected 108 data sets for 760 locations, with about 12,000 individual observations on crop res maize responses, in this case, to um, fertilizer. We built machine learning uh, uh, models from it to understand uh, response to nitrogen, response to phosphate, and then did similar work with input price, output prices, and look at you know, fertilizer use profitability you know, under certain scenarios across the continent. Yeah, I won't go into the details of this any further. Uh, this work is currently uh, under review. Um, and I just really, in the you know, couple of minutes that I have, want to speak a bit more about you know, how to do this. You know, how, what, are the, what are the challenges with interoperability? How do we put this all together? And that is really um, an area where, where a lot of progress needs to be made. Here's one example of one data set um, that you would get when you download um, uh, these data from uh, through Guard or you find it through Guardian and you download it typically you know, through the centers uh, or however you download it. Um, here, you, for example, you see, you know, this is one Excel uh, sheets, but there's really two tables in it. it. Makes it pretty difficult to automatically read. There's an empty line at the top. It really should have been one uh, a long table. Uh, here's another case where you have three experiments, uh, but rather than putting them underneath each other with one variable saying you know which experiment it is, they're putting uh, side they're they put together be put together sideways. And these are just two very simple examples um, of how data isn't well organized. And again, you know, these are simple examples, and, and they're easy enough to to fix. But there's many that are much more complex, where there's multiple tables in, in Excel sheets. Uh, a typ another typical problem is, as you could see here, um, uh, I, I cut it off. But you know what you sometimes see is that treatments are, are become variables. So the yields for treatment one, the yield for treatment two, rather than a true variable, um, like like it actually is done here in this example, which is the correct way. And, and, the, and the, the bottom line is that it seems to me that many um, practicing researchers really are very ill prepared to do data management and don't seem to understand the difference between managing and sharing data and how you organize data for that purpose with um, how you might want to have your or data organized for a particular, to make a particular graph or do a particular analysis. And so that's, this is really something we need to work on. In the extreme case, you know, the worst case, you get something like this, you know, the Africa Rice has a couple of data sets that they share. And what they've basically done is, you know, co copy and paste um, screenshots from tables from publications into an Excel spreadsheet. So, of course, that's, that's uh, you know, quite useless um, for automatic uh, aggregation and reuse of data. So interoperability is, is a problem. Uh, and now, uh, how, how do we then deal with that? You know, how did essentially, you know, how did Camila put together all these data sets to create this one large data set, which, which she built this machine learning model? Well, uh, what we do is for each um, data set, we create an R script. And here's just one example for one particular data set. And I just want to point out to you two uh, nice things about it. One is that we use an URI, or in, in this case, a DOI, so a unique identifier for a data set. And then in the agro package, which, which is a new package, uh, R package we developed, we have this function called get data from URI, provide the URI and the, and the location where you want to store the data. And it automatically downloads when it isn't there yet. Uh, otherwise, it just reads it again. And it tells you what, what the files are that are in there. It also reads a, a JSON file that from, from which you can extract uh, the version number, um, which can be important because you know, the data sets get updated and if the version change, you may have to uh, check your script. And then, of course, there's, but then there's, you know, sometimes 100 lines below this just to get the data in shape. And it would be really nice if that could be reduced in the future. And so this is our workflow. Many data sets, you know, what I missed here, maybe I should have said, you know, search, find data sets. Each data set gets a script. The script goes to, to a GitHub repo. And then there's a master script that reads all individual uh, scripts or, or runs them, creates a standard, you know, for, so now we create for each data set a standard format, and then we uh, aggregate that into a new single database that then can be used for the kind of analysis we did. But it also should, you know, and that's our plan maybe early next year or so to put it back onto, onto a place where Guardian can find it so that others can use it. 
what, what's important here and what we're working on right now is, you know, when we first did this or Camila really did this, you know, you know, she learned as, as she went along. Now we're stepping back a bit and saying, well, okay, how can we set up these scripts such that we can collaborate on this aggregation process? So my idea here is that, that you know, the, we should avoid doing these one-off aggregations, rather there should be community efforts to do aggregations of data sets such that multiple questions um, can be asked and such that the data sets can improve over time so that people can help fix mistakes that were made because you know there's a lot of problems with interp uh, you know, inter interpretation. So in conclusion, in this very brief uh, uh, talk, you know, all data can be used for new research and development. Data sharing is often couched as important for reproducibility and whereas reproducibility is interesting and important in, in, in and of itself, it is the new research that we can do with it. I think that is the really exciting part about it. Um, and we can create these empirical models that will improve it as more data comes along. So even though, you know, some of, some of the initial results are not, are, you know, there are some questions around it and some uncertainty, but uh, over time, of course, this is going to be more and more important. I emphasize the traceability. So, you know, rather than uh, just putting it together by copy and paste, every step is done through a script so that things can be approved on, criticized uh, and expanded. Uh, and then the final point here, researchers, at, at the peers empirically are awful data managers and really um, a lot of capacity building has to be done or empowerment of data managers or whatever it takes uh, to go from, from the really sort of dismal kind of way that data are shared to a much more um, uh, easy to use, uh, you know, to, 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 so that we get data sets uh, in a form that we can use much more easily. You know, having said that, you know, this is not a real surprise. Um, you know, my first slide showed, you know, how wonderful it is, how amazing it is that all this data is available now. Now that it's open, openly available, we see that there's a lot of problems, uh, but there's nothing we can't fix. So that's what I hope to contribute in, uh, to over the, over the coming uh, years. Thank you. And over to Annie. Thank you, Robert. I'm going to share my screen now. So uh, my name is Ani Ghosh. I'm an agriculture risk data scientist with the Alliance of Biodiversity and SEAT, and I'm really excited to be here and present some of the works that I've been doing with one of the components of the Guardian ecosystem that Meta described earlier as uh, the data analytics component and specifically the CG Labs, how we have been using CG Labs for some of our projects, how we set it up and how we collaborate efficiently across continent and what kind of improvements we would like to uh, see in future uh, in the CG Labs uh, infrastructure. So this is a team effort. So uh, some of the results that I will be showing it, it came from uh, our uh, colleagues, uh, Prakash uh, and Julian, uh, who are based out of Kali, uh, and I'm based at Nairobi. So what CG Labs looks like, you probably are familiar with this uh, interface from uh, Meta's presentation. So for a user, like I look, I see it as a portable workstation, like it's like, okay, this is something I log into the browser and I see this interface. So it's like, okay, it's the same for me. I don't have to worry about whether uh, I have a power or whether I have uh, sufficient storage or anything. It's just more like, okay, it's an online interface running somewhere. Uh, and whether I am on uh, my office or I'm in the like traveling, uh, I, if I have internet connection, I can log into it. And it gives me access to uh, terminals uh, or notebooks with uh, Git, uh, GitHub integrations and also like uh, nice tools for file transfers and other uh, wills and whistles. Now from system administrations, like I kind of like try to sometimes manage my own systems also depending on my need. So from the system administration point of view, it's like a complete Jupyter Hub, Jupyter Hub experience, but which is which has been tailored for uh, agriculture type of research. Like uh, let's say you, you want to use some of the spatial packages in Python or in R or machine learning packages in R, then this has been uh, modified uh, in a way that uh, you can use it pretty e pretty easily. I'm not saying that that can't be used in Jupyter Hub environment, but this is like a uh, updated version uh, or modified version that is uh, much more user friendly to implement. Now, what, what is there? So there is uh, uh, like a terminal support. Uh, you can run uh, a, a, anything that you can uh, probably run on a Linux uh, terminal. There is R notebook, Python notebook support, as well as uh, Julia support. And you can also edit text files and markdown files. So it's, it's been like a complete uh, 
a set of tools that a data scientist might need for some of the analysis. Now, if we dive down a little bit to details, so there are basically three main components. One is the code sharing, another is the data, and third is the compute resources. So, or maybe I should have uh, told it from the other way because compute resources is the most important part. So. Uh, Let's let's a little bit talk about the compute resources. So what what this uh, CG Labs is is a is a Docker or a, like you can say it's a uh, operating system with some uh, software already installed it that we already we need for our applications, and you can install it in any of the computing platforms. Like you can install it in the cloud. Uh, for example, Amazon Web Services or Google Cloud or Azure, or you can also install it in your local computer or your workstation. It should all, anywhere you install it, you always get this kind of interface. So that's kind of nice because when you are collaborating, then you know that when your colleagues are also logged in into CG Labs, they are also looking at the same type of infrastructure, same type of package, and same version of the package, which is also quite important. And then there is a data storage. So when it is installed in cloud, uh, it, it makes really easy uh, for in terms of the data because uh, oftentimes, like especially with the CGIR researcher, because we are located in places where internet is not that great. So uh, if we install, if we are able to install in the clouds, then it gives us real benefit of like getting all the data set in in the cloud uh, where uh, it is hosted, and uh, and th that opens up this whole lot of questions around what Robert was discussing, like, okay, can we integrate that with Guardian? Uh, how can we, uh, like, have another data set, other data sets which are not in Guardian, like general data set, like soil properties or uh, weather or climate, other climate? Or what if I have my own data in my local computer, which I want to upload uh, in the CG lab. So all, all these all this, uh, integrations are uh, uh, developing. Some of them are there, but it's, it's also like under development. And the other thing is how do we uh, collaborate among researchers? Like how do you collaborate among the group? So that's basically done through a nifty way. We have a kit integration uh, that is uh, like you can, you can create repositories uh, following the same framework that Robert showed earlier. And uh, you can just use the Git as a uh, code sharing platform. So I'm just, go I'm just going to show two use cases that we uh, use CG Labs quite extensively. Uh, one is for crop suitability mapping. Another is for uh, yield prediction, is yield, yield prediction related research. Uh, and those are like broader themes and they have been uh, used and also being used by a number of other uh, projects. Uh, that we are involved in. So for the crop suitability uh, work, uh, basically the challenge was for us to download the global uh, climate data set uh, from the past and the future uh, downscale data set, and also run hundreds of simulations where we want to do uh, some uh, modeling with eco crops, some with uh, machine learning for 40 plus crops that is present in the map spam database, and also with different type of climate scenario combinations. So we kind of developed this uh, reproducible workflow. Uh, so first we download the data and then we uh, run our eco crop uh, model on it. So uh, basically, uh, we write our functions uh, and then just allow uh, our system admin to like give us access to a large number of cores so that we can run it on. Let's say uh, here I'm showing an example where we, we have been using six cores in the uh, instance, but it can be like up to 60 or 100, no matter what you have access to. So it's it's basically a very nice way of scaling up your machine uh, when you need it, and then you just uh, switch it off when you don't need it. So just uh, on that uh, point, like when we were using this, uh, when we were running the suitability analysis, we are using a machine with 64 cores, 512 gigabit of RAM, which is, which is pretty big machine. And then once our analysis was uh, complete, we scaled it down to a pretty small machine so that our uh, cloud computing cost is also minimum. So this kind of helped us to develop uh, uh, like crop suitability maps or uh, data set for different countries for different crops. So these are just some of the outputs that we use some of our, uh, in, in some of our projects related to uh, private sector investment opportunity. So then the next one I was going to talk about is uh, doing crop yield prediction at scale and also uh, using two of the most uh, widely used crop models. So one is, uh, one is UFOST and another is DSAT. So, our, so the UFOST is nice, it's thanks to Robert. We have a nice package and the only thing we needed to do is to run a, a, is to write a function which operates uh, in the spatial dimension at that point. But I think the recent version of RUFOST actually 
or has this special bottling component in it. So what we wanted to do is uh, for specific crops we, for entire East Africa region, we wanted to do it. it we wanted to estimate the yield potential. So uh, basically we follow the same protocol, like we downloaded the data, we created a daily data set that as we needed it, and everything was done in uh, the instance that we are running for CG Labs. And, and here's the best thing, like we just, which made the changes for once, like, okay, we want to do this kind of, uh, we wanted to do this, we wanted this kind of package or this kind of setup. For example, when you go to DSAT, uh, DSAT is not similar as our UFOST. Like we, we, you need to kind of do some system calls to run the uh, DSAT and you have to create these input files, which are kind of tricky to uh, develop. But at the same time, each simulation takes time because you have to format your files. Once you get the output, you have to save the output. It takes time. So what we did was we uh, uh, used some uh, nice tricks to, uh, uh, to uh, kind of improvise the simulation. And we ended up having like a, let's say five seconds uh, time for each simulation. So, and that enabled us to do a lot of uh, crop simulation work that we wanted to, we have on our table, uh, it's like ranging from uh, like simulating uh, yield from, let's say for the, uh, from the current situation to uh, in the future in 2070 uh, for different type of combinations, like changing planting days, changing cultivars and everything. And entire thing was done, uh, in the, uh, in the again in the CG Labs instance by uh, colleagues who are working from three different continents on this particular uh, uh, topic. So and, and this allowed us to create this kind of uh, data product, uh, which we are now using for several other publications and also as um, uh, other uh, project. So so this was a. Uh, so th this is the, basically the use cases. Now, how can you customize it? It's really easy. Like the, we all do it all the time. For example, you want to add more uh, packages that you need. So basically you just go to the website, uh, the, uh, the GitHub uh, repository for this, uh, 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 for, for CG Labs and you just uh, alter it. So, and then it should work. So I, I recommend that you go there and have a look at it. Now, uh, what, do we ex what do we need in the future? So. The future, uh, for future, we definitely want few improvements. One is basically uh, connection to the storage, uh, cloud storage. For example, we want direct connections to S3, Amazon cloud storage or Google cloud storage. Uh, and e even uh, with automatic, uh, even with local file systems. And we want that uh, storage to be shared between the users, which, which has been a real bottleneck for us. Like it's not all rosy with the CG Labs at this stage. Uh, we, the, sh the storage is a big problem um, with us uh, or have been a big problem for all of our work. Work. Uh, we definitely want cluster support. We want it to natively support uh, clusters like Kubernetes so that we can always uh, take advantage of uh, clusters uh, as we need it for larger processing. And we also need it to like uh, support auto scaling. Like, okay, for some projects we want to do less, uh, thousands of cores. For some projects when we are run, not running it, we want to bring it down to five cores to save cost. So that's something we need to do uh, automatically, but uh, like not supported through any kind of system admin. And then uh, it's kind of, the last one is kind of related to the uh, auto scaling is basically like we want to uh, have the ability to set it up on uh, a spot or preemptible instance to, to reduce down our cost. Like uh, just to give you some cost estimate, like this entire project we did, it cost it did cost us around ten thousand dollars. But like if we could make some of the infrastructure development, uh, I I think that it could be reduced down to as low as four thousand dollars. So there is a lot of opportunity uh, uh, there. Uh, so I'm, I'm really hoping that in the next iteration of CG Labs over the uh, next year or uh, like uh, after that, we will be able to see this kind of improvement. And that is all from my end and it's over to Cheryl now. Thank you, Sanjay. Okay, um, I was happy to hear both Robert and Ani's presentations because they were a great segue into what I'm going to talk about, um, which is the Agricultural Research Data Network, or ARDEN. So this started out as um, data interoperability tools that were created uh, by and for AGNET for ensemble crop modeling activities. 
And from there, uh, we worked with Meta and the CGI, our big data platform, to provide a set of data annotation protocols, specifically for Guardian, that would allow us to annotate data sets, particularly legacy data sets, that will allow us to interpret them in an automated way. Um, uh, we're currently also working with the USDA National Agricultural Library under a grant from NIFA to extend these data annotation protocols for use on Ag Data Commons. So when all of these parts are put together, um, these systems will be interoperable with each other. And in addition, we're working with IFDC, the International Fertilizer Development Center, um, on a similar system for their data sharing. So um, the problem is that we have a supply of data on one hand and a demand for data on the other. And Robert very nicely outlined why bridging that gap is hard, because these data sets are in different formats, different schemas, they use different vocabularies, or in different physical locations um, in a distributed set of databases. Um, so what we're proposing is to use some existing translators developed by AgMEP and also with these new data annotation standards to, to be able to get from the supply of data to um, the people who want to use those data. So one of our um, use cases that we've been using a lot, in fact, you saw Ava in Robert's slides, um, so in this use case, uh, Crop Modeler wants to find data sets that fit her needs for a particular study. So she puts a search term, she puts a set of search terms into Guardian. Um, this goes out and finds data sets that meet those search terms and these external data sets that are around the world. It could, you know, they're a distributed set of databases. She finds some qualifying data sets that are annotated such that they can be interpreted in an automated way and run through AgMEP translators, and voila, we have model-ready data. So how it works with these annotations are that you can think of these annotations as extended metadata that sit on Guardian and allow uh, data to be discovered through the semantic web. That's this sidecar file one. Sidecar file two provides this roadmap for translation to AgMet formats, such that now if we can interpret those data and put them into a common vocabulary that AgMet has um, adopted, we can then use all those translators for these various end use uh, formats. And the third is um, a searchable index data, which will allow fast, complex searching um, using subsets of the data that are sitting on Guardian, such that the, the remote data sets don't have to be interpreted on the fly for some um, advanced search. So there's various workflows associated with this work. One of them um, up in the top left is the data provider tools. So we're, we're creating tools that will make it easier for data providers to be able to provide these annotations such that their data can be interpreted in an automated way. Um, and I should say at this point that um, in the future, what we strive for is data to be collected with the proper annotations at the time of collection. So most of what we're developing here is for some of these legacy data sets that do not use a standard um, vocabulary or format. So in this way, if we have this um, group of this network of data sets that have been annotated in this way, they can now be collected, um, um, they can be aggregated, they can be used for um, larger meta-analyses in, in a way that is that might be quite different from the original purpose that the research data were collected. Um, okay, so how do we do this? I'm gonna take as an example, a data set from Guardian. This is a Tomasa Ethiopia variety phenology calibration data set. And it's basically in um, a set of spreadsheets. Um, 
and this is a, a very well organized data set. It, it was, um, we use it as our poster child because it is so well organized. It's sort of the low hanging fruit. We have a tool uh, called VMapper that allows us to read this spreadsheet um, into the tool and it will allow the user to identify and, and map each um, term in that data set to the standardized vocabulary. In this case, it's the ACASA vocabulary that AGMIP has used for its translators. Um, so this is, this is a new feature that um, even Meta hasn't seen yet. So this is, this is, we're really excited about this because this was a missing link in, in that whole chain of making data interoperable. And what it produces is this sidecar file too, which is basically a JSON file. It's got information about where the data set is, how to access it, where within that data set the actual data you're interested in exists, uh, information about the proper ACASA term to use for each variable, and also the units of the raw data such that at translation time, it can be translated into the units that are associated with ACASA. Okay, so now um, end user tools are also important to link this whole chain together. And so now that we have been able to annotate data, we can um, translate it to this AGMAP format, this ACE-B, which stands for AGMAP Prop Experiment Binary Format. And there are some existing translators that allow us to take that and put it in very specific formats needed for multi-models. Um, yeah, so the AGMET translators were developed to use multiple data sources and formats, put it into a harmonized uh, format with a standard vocabulary. It allows a user to supply any missing information, and then um, it provides those to the very different model-specific formats needed by multi-models. This is just an example of that um, Tomasa data that was translated to BSAT. Um, and it was used for calibration of the various cultivars, which were then used in a countrywide study in Ethiopia, um, allowing us to um, look at various scenarios for future climate and adaptation. So thank you all. And Meta, back to you. Thank you very much to our speakers. I think we're probably out of time. I don't know if there are questions. Um, but I will pause here. Thank you very much to, to, for, to the attendees for, for listening to us and a huge vote of thanks to the speakers.